Hello beautiful friends, my name is Brittany. Welcome back or welcome to Rusties and Reads. Today we're here to do the next video in the bookshelf series that I'm doing here on my channel where we go through my book collection one shelf at a time. <laughs> I apologize if my voice sounds like kind of low and husky. I have a kind of cold, like it's never turned into a full blown cold, but I do have some of the symptoms of a cold, like a slightly stuffy runny nose and then like a scratchy throat. So if I sound weird, that is why. So today the books that we're covering are going to be the rest of my book of the month collection. And then after my book of the month collection, it immediately goes into contemporaries at both adult and young adult. And I classify contemporaries as books that are basically set in more modern time periods. They don't really have any kind of historical aspect to them. In general, these all are just set in a modern setting, a modern realistic setting, so there are also no fantastical elements to them. At the end of the last video, we ended with Riley Sager, but it wasn't all of my Riley Sager books, so I'm going to run through the rest of my Riley Sager books here. The first Riley Sager book I ever read, and is still to this day the worst Riley Sager book I ever read, Final Girls. I was actually actively filming booktube videos when I read this book. I think I first read this book in 2019, I believe, and I went on full-blown rants about this book. So the premise of this book is that somebody is out there killing final girls. It was very different from what I expected it to be. And it was primarily focusing on our main final girl. I think her name is Quincy and her relationship with another final girl. And it just really didn't work for me. I didn't really like the whole premise of the story. I didn't even like the so-called twist. I found the twist fairly predictable. Nothing about this book worked for me and it didn't deliver the vibes that I was looking for. So I'm actually surprised after finishing this book that I did continue on with Riley Sager, but I did. And he's now definitely one of my favorite like mystery thriller authors even though his books are extremely hit or miss but this still remains to this day the worst one that I've ever read for him and so far none of his other books no matter how disappointed I might be in them has ever reached the aggravation and frustration level that I felt with this book. I know that's an unpopular opinion this today still seems to be one of his most popular and most beloved books it just oh my gosh I hated this book so much however a book of his that I absolutely loved was the last time I lied. So this follows our main character Emma and when she was a young girl she went to this summer camp situation where she was sharing a cabin with three girls and one night those three girls left the cabin and never came back and so she's still kind of haunted by that situation and today she's kind of a very successful artist she's growing in the New York art scene and her paintings actually catch the attention of the owner of Camp Nightingale which is where all of this happens and she contacts Emma and she says I'm reopening Camp Nightingale and I would love for you to come back and be a painting instructor so of course Emma is very reluctant to do so but she comes back and she is basically determined to find out what happened to those three girls so long ago I I really enjoyed this one so much. I enjoyed the summer camp atmosphere of this and I especially enjoyed the twist at the end. The twist at the end got me. I'm not gonna lie. It really got me. I did not see it coming. I don't know if that was just me. I mean, I'm usually really good at seeing plot twists coming because I read so many mystery thrillers, but the twist at the end of this, I just remember my reaction was like, well done, Mr. Sager. And I think actually that is what I put in my Goodreads review. That's all that I put was like, well done. This was definitely such a redemption from the final girl's experience that I had. I just enjoyed this one immensely. These next two, however, were just very mediocre. So I have Lock Every Door, and this one is our main character who seems to have gotten a too-good-to-be-true opportunity to apartment sit at the Bartholomew, which is this very luxury apartment building. I think it's in New York, but don't quote me on that. But this apartment building has a lot of very strict rules. You can't have any visitors, can't spend a night away from the apartment, definitely can't bother any of the other residents who are all like rich and famous people. But Jules, our main character, she ends up trying to build a friendship with a woman who is also an apartment sitter and and one day this woman just completely disappears without a trace. And Jules finds herself trying to figure out what actually happened to this apartment sitter because she thinks something sinister went down and it goes from there. And then of course you figure out the reveal, find out why this apartment complex is so secretive and why there are all these rules attached to it. And overall it was an okay reading experience. I didn't think that there was anything completely unique or mind-blowing about it. And the twist was, I don't know, I guess it could be considered shocking, but it was also so ridiculously mundane. And I can't really say anything more about it. It just, I was unimpressed by the twist at the end. So this one didn't work for me as well as The Last Time I Lied or Home Before Dark, but again, still nothing nearly as terrible as Final Girls for me. The final one that I have here is Survive the Night, and I think this is probably unanimously one of almost everybody's least favorite stories. It's definitely not one of mine. I think I disliked Lock Every Door more than this, and again, definitely disliked Final Girls more than this, but I can understand why people didn't like this. So this book is actually set in the early 90s, and our main character, Charlie Jordan, is desperate to leave her college campus because 
because there have been a string of like murders on her college campus. They're calling him the campus killer and her best friend was actually a victim. And so she just needs to get away. And so she goes to this ride share board because she's trying to get back home to Ohio and she accepts a ride from this guy named Josh who she doesn't really know. And it doesn't take long for Charlie to become suspicious of Josh. There are a lot of holes in the story that he is telling. And then when she catches him in kind of an outright lie, she begins to realize that she could be in some serious trouble. And then there's like a game of cat and mouse on dark rural roads. You know, Charlie is really isolated. She's alone. This is the time before cell phones and things of that nature. So that's really where the thrill and the atmosphere comes in, which was fantastic. I always feel like Riley Sager does atmosphere extremely well in his books. And that was no different in here. I just remember having a lot of technical issues with this story. Like, first of all, I predicted who the campus killer was from page nine of this book. So in that way, it was predictable. But this story actually did go into an entirely different direction that I was not expecting. And so I do applaud Sager for that because it was completely different from the direction that I think anybody was expecting it to go in. And I didn't even mind the direction that it went. I think a lot of people were conflicted over the direction that it took. I wasn't. I kind of enjoyed it to an extent. What really, really got me about this story is that Charlie sees movies in her head. It's almost like daydreaming where suddenly she will just kind of zone out and these very realistic daydreams will go through her head as if they are happening, as if she is in a movie and these things are happening. And so sometimes she's often not able to determine what is real and what is not. So sometimes she'll zone out for seconds or minutes at a time living this scenario she has created in her head. And now I am obviously not a medical expert. I have no idea if this is a real thing, if this really could happen. But for me, it just did not feel realistic. And it just was a way for Riley Sager to make his main character unreliable. And I feel like there were a lot of better, more realistic ways that he could have done that. That was my main gripe about the story, not necessarily like the overall plot. Not his strongest, but definitely not his worst in my opinion. Next, I have One Day in December by Josie Silver. And I absolutely loved this charming holiday read. I gave this a 4.5 stars, but I know that a lot of people don't like it and I kind of understand why. So this follows our main character, Lori, and one day she is on a bus going home. And while she's on the bus, she and this very handsome man waiting at a bus stop kind of lock eyes and there's this intense instant attraction. And they are so caught up in it that the man, even though this is not the bus he needs, tries to get on the bus, but he misses it. It was kind of a missed connection, if you will. And so Lori becomes not necessarily obsessed, but she would definitely not mind finding this man again. And her roommate and best friend is definitely as obsessed as she is. And so they're trying to find bus boy. And when he's found, it is not in the way that Lori hoped or expected because he comes home with Sarah as Sarah's boyfriend. Jack is the name of bus boy. And so this book is set over 10 years as you're following the trials and tribulations of Jack and Lori, as they kind of realize who the other is, as they kind of deal with that, you know, and then they start to build this pretty strong friendship because Jack and Sarah have a pretty great relationship. And Lori obviously doesn't want to ruin that. Jack doesn't want to ruin that. And it just kind of progresses from there. Obviously at some point they can no longer deny their feelings for each other and things just escalate. I understand that a lot of people had problems with this because essentially throughout this book, there was a lot of emotional cheating at the very, very least until it gets to the point where kind of Sarah realizes the truth about what's happening and so on and so forth. But I, this just worked for me. I thought that this was a beautiful story. I very much rooted for Jack and Lori, even though I probably shouldn't have because of his relationship with Sarah. And so I definitely understand why this might not be a popular story, but this was a solid romance for me. Next, I have three books by Simone St. James. I have Broken Girls, The Sundown Motel, and The Book of Cold Cases. I'm not going to go into too terribly much detail about all of these books, but I would just kind of like to touch upon The Sundown Motel because this was my first ever experience by Simone St. James. I tore through this book in 24 hours. It was compulsively readable. It was thrilling. It was suspenseful. It was atmospheric. A common theme among all of Simone St. James's books are ghosts. Ghosts are actually real and a thing in her books. And I really love the way, especially that she used ghosts in the Sundown Motel. So the present day timeline in 2017, you're following our main character, Carly. And many years before she was even born, Carly's aunt Viv in the early 1980s disappeared without a trace. And Carly's mom never knew what happened to her sister. And Carly's mom has now passed away. And so Carly is taking it upon herself to find out what actually happened to her aunt Viv. Now in the early 1980s, Viv had wanted to move to New York City and to help fund this move, she took a job as the overnight clerk at the Sundown Motel, which was in a smaller city in New York. And then one day Viv ups and disappears and nobody knows what happens to her. So now Carly is returning to not only the city in which Viv disappeared, but the actual place. Carly basically is able to obtain the same exact position that Viv had back in the early 1980s. And she is determined to discover what happened to her Aunt Viv. Like I said, this was so atmospheric and well done and it was thrilling and I just wanted to keep turning the pages. And like I said, her other books all feature ghosts in some capacity. Ghosts play a larger role in some than others, but they definitely all are featured in these 
books and I just love the way that Simone St. James is able to utilize them within the books and the overall plot and stuff of her stories are actually pretty interesting as well. I'm very excited to hopefully see another new release from her soon and so that I can dive more into her stories. Next I have Girl Forgotten by Karen Slaughter. This is actually the second in her Andrea Oliver series. I don't know if it's going to be beyond a duology. I haven't looked into that further enough but as of right now it is two stories. If you all recently watched my worst and most disappointing books of 2022 you will know that Pieces of Her which was the very first book is one of the worst books that I read in 2022 just because it was not up to the standard that I've come to know from Karen Slaughter and I found the main character in that story completely and utterly useless and she annoyed me to no end. I have never been so viscerally frustrated by a character in my life and that really affected my reading experience. This follows Andrea Oliver two years in the future and she's now actually a U.S. Marshal and she is a much more grown and developed person. She's definitely far more capable than she was in the first story. I don't really want to give anything away about what you could have found out in pieces of her but for the most part I feel like this could really be read as a standalone. You won't get the context of Andrea Oliver's history but I don't feel like you need to know that in order to understand the story. There is a past timeline and a murder that takes place and in the present you're following Andrea as she's being tasked to protect a judge who is getting death threats. At the same time it was this judge's daughter I think if I'm remembering correctly it was this judge's daughter that was killed in the past timeline and Andrea has a reason for wanting to try to solve the murder of that girl. So there are multiple things happening in the present timeline as Andrea is trying to protect the judge and trying to find out who is sending her death threats but there's also something else that Andrea needs to solve as well and even though she's a brand new marshal like newly minted just inducted as a marshal she is being sent on this more complicated high profile case because of the past timeline there's a reason why and of course you find all of that in this book and it also does play a little bit into what happened in pieces of her but I thought this was solid this was very well done I enjoyed this immensely I came to really grow to like Andrea Oliver so this was definitely multi-layered it was a little bit complex I love the way that Karen Slaughter wove all of it together this was definitely redeemable from pieces of her in my opinion and if there are more that come out in the series I would absolutely be willing to read them in the future. Then I have one to watch by Kate Stamen London and holy cow y'all did this book come in and knock me off my feet. This was a solid five star read and I gushed about this on Goodreads. I would recommend that you go read that Goodreads review for more of my articulate thoughts on this because it was absolutely phenomenal. I did not expect to love this book as much as I did. Not only was this well written and just a solid romance overall but it opened up so many conversations about body positivity, fat shaming, unrealistic beauty expectations and things of that nature. So this follows our main character B. Schumacher and she is a plus size like fashion blogger and even though she is a well-known and well-respected fashion blogger she has kind of grown up her whole life believing that because she is big she is somehow worth less and she also feels the need to really control her online image because she knows how cruel the internet could be. And in this story there is a show called Main Squeeze. It is a little bit like The Bachelor Bachelorette and B is kind of sick of the lack of diversity on the show both in like body type and race and all of that stuff and so she goes online she goes on to this tirade and she is surprised to be contacted by Main Squeeze and she's asked if she wants to be the next basically bachelorette and so she goes on the show and it goes from there. I'm not going to say much more about it because like I said this was absolutely wonderful and I really wrote this very articulate in-depth review about body shaming and why people feel like they have the right to body shame and society's unrealistic beauty standards and everything like that on Goodreads. I just feel like this book did an excellent job of shining the spotlight on all of these issues and doing so in a very poignant way. I found B to be a very relatable character. I loved her so much and it was very entertaining to see her go through all of these experiences with dating these different guys, seeing maybe their motives, how they were towards B and things like that and the criticism that she received. B herself was also just a phenomenal character who was full of agency and I loved immensely a lot of the messages that were in this story. So I highly recommend this. Like I said, this was an easy, easy five stars and I can't wait to read more from Kate Stamen London in the future if she puts anything else out. Next, I have A Flicker in the Dark by Stacey Willingham. You might be seeing this go around a lot in the online bookish community just because Stacey Willingham's sophomore novel has recently come out or is coming out in the future. But this book follows our main character, Chloe Davis. And when she was 12, I believe it was like six girls went missing in her Louisiana town. And her father actually confessed to these murders and was put away in prison. And then 20 years in the future, Chloe is like a successful psychiatrist. She's about to get married. She seems to have like kind of a firm grasp on life. But then one day some girls start going missing again in her hometown. And so she reluctantly returns home to see if she can try to figure out what is happening. I admit that I don't remember a whole heck of a lot of the details about this book. I believe I remember the twist 
overall, which I enjoyed, although it was somewhat predictable in my opinion. I do remember thinking that this was a solid debut and enjoying it enough that I really wanted to jump on the chance of getting her newest release, which I do have and it did come as a book of the month edition. So I'm excited to go ahead and dive into that. Like I said, I thought this was a solid debut and I recommend and I love the fact that it was set in Louisiana, which you know, I'm very close to in the atmosphere in here, like the humidity and the swampiness and all of that stuff. Like I could just feel and relate to just because it is my life. I'm here in Mississippi. I'm right next door to Louisiana. So some of the stuff that she was saying, I could really just picture in my head. So the atmosphere was fantastic in here as well. So definitely recommend. Next, I have A History of Wild Places by Shay Earnshaw. I have read two of Shay Earnshaw's Young Adult and I really enjoy her writing and the atmosphere that she puts into her books is just astonishing. I love the way that she's able to make atmosphere a character in her books. This book, I would say, is on the weirder side. It is her first stab at adult speculative fiction, I believe. And the way I would typically describe this book, this is the book that M. Night Shyamalan would write if he was taking a stab at speculative fiction because it definitely has that weirdness to it that you would expect from an M. Night Shyamalan movie. So this book is primarily following the community of pastoral. This is a community that was created in the 1970s for people who just wanted to escape. Escape the draft, escape the war. But in the present day, pastoral pastoral is plagued by fear and people are not allowed to leave the boundaries of pastoral for fear of the rot, which is a sickness that they believe has ravaged the surrounding forests and will definitely kill all of the people within pastoral if they contract it. Theo, who is a lifelong resident of pastoral, can't help but yearn for something more. He kind of wants to see what is beyond the boundaries of pastoral and so he kind of starts to experiment going beyond the borders a little bit more every single day. And while he's doing that one night, he discovers an abandoned truck that will lead to a mystery that involves pastoral. And while he and his wife Kala try to solve this mystery, a lot of things will be uncovered. I would say that there are two main twists, but they kind of work together. And I found it interesting the direction that she took it, but not necessarily believable. It was kind of unusual, and I don't necessarily think that it would be feasible or plausible. But overall, I enjoyed my reading experience of this. And like I said, the atmosphere in here is just unmatched. So I would be interested in reading more of Shay Earnshaw's adult novels in the future if she releases any. I wasn't necessarily emotionally connected to the story, but I did love the atmosphere. I did like the mystery that they were trying to solve. And then ultimately that twist, it was just a combination of like, huh? And hmm. You know, it was like both of those things. I didn't know whether to be confused or impressed or not. I don't necessarily know if I entirely understand what happened in here, but it was a very interesting read. This next book is one that I've talked about quite frequently on my channel. It made the best books of 2022 list. So I'm not going to talk about it too much here, but that is Book Lovers by Emily Henry. This is a romantic contemporary novel that follows our main character, Nora Stevens, who is a cutthroat literary agent, as well as Charlie Lastra, who is an editor. And what happens when they come together and all of the banter and everything that is involved. I love this story so much. I loved Emily Henry's writing. I loved the chemistry between the two. And like I said, the banter is 100% perfection. This is also the story of sisters because it follows heavily Nora and her relationship with her sister Libby. They used to be quite close. They're not necessarily growing apart, but they don't really share as much with each other as they used to. This is also about finding them like reconnecting and all of that good stuff. There was a lot of layers to this story and I loved it so much. Next, I only have one Colleen Hoover and that's just because this is literally like the only hardcover Colleen Hoover that I have. Most of the time her stuff is released in paperback and that's where the bulk of her stories are. They're on my paperback shelf just back there. But I did get this beautiful special edition of Verity. It's got her signature in foil on the naked hardcover. So I actually have or had complex feelings regarding Verity. The more time away that I've had from it, the more I appreciate it. During my actual time in the story, I had complicated feelings. Verity was Colleen Hoover's first foray into like mystery thrillers and I thought she did a spectacular job with it. Like for the first, probably like 97, 98% of this book, I was in it. I was invested. I loved it. She was really good at making this suspenseful. So this follows our main character, Lowen Ashley, and she is a struggling writer and she's basically on the brink of financial destitution. She definitely needs work. And so she is presented with an offer that she can't refuse. She meets with the husband of famed author Verity Crawford, and he lets her know that Verity is no longer capable of completing this very popular series because she has been in an accident. She's basically unable to walk or talk or move or do anything. And so she cannot finish this series that is so beloved. And so Jeremy has sought out Lowen to finish Verity's series. So in order to do this, Lowen actually moves in with Jeremy, Verity, their kids, because she needs to go through Verity's office and her files to figure out kind of where she planned on taking the story. But while she's doing that, she uncovers a manuscript that Verity wrote. And it doesn't paint Verity in a very good light. It paints Verity in a very psychologically disturbed light. And so you're following Lowen in the present. And then you're also following the details of the 
this manuscript. And then it goes from there, especially as Lowen is kind of developing some inappropriate feelings for Jeremy and they strike up this relationship. So there's a lot going on in the story. And like I said, I was loving it and I was eating it up for the first, I don't know, like 97, 98% of the story. What really got to me was the manuscript reveal about the motivation behind the manuscript and what went into it. There was a lot of exposition written about this manuscript. That felt like a cop out to me. I really didn't enjoy the place that Colleen Hoover took that. There were a couple of other twists in there as well, which I enjoyed and I thought were well done. And just the ultimate very end of the story, how it ended, it does kind of leave you like mouth open. So overall, I think Colleen Hoover did a fantastic job with the story. And like I said, the more distance that I have from it, the more that I can appreciate every aspect of it, even the manuscript part. But like I said, while I was reading it and while I got to that part where they were kind of explaining the manuscript and the content of the manuscript, I was just like, hmm, this feels kind of unusual and like a cop out. And I do think that this could do with a reread to see if I can appreciate it more now that I know everything. But just those complicated feelings alone made me feel like it was worth it to get this beautiful special edition. So I did. Next, I have two Leanne Moriarty books. I have What Alice Forgot. So this follows our main character, Alice, who wakes up on the floor of her gym and doesn't really remember the past 10 years of her life. The last thing she remembers is that she's 29, she's married, happily married, and she's expecting her first child. And now she's 39. She's got three children. The honeymoon phase is basically over. Her and her husband are basically separated or divorced. And she doesn't remember any of the last 10 years. And so this is about her experience trying to reconcile what her life was and what it is. And as she's starting to get her memory back and starting to realize kind of like what caused the rift between her and her husband, it's about her trying to basically fix her life. I don't remember a whole heck of a lot of the details to be honest with you because it's been a very, very long time. I just remember that I thought it was poignant trying to watch Alice reconcile who she is now with who she once was. This was actually my very first Leanne Moriarty and it definitely made me want to read more. And then one literally everybody has heard about, Big Little Lies, which is a combination of like contemporary fiction with a twist of mystery thriller because this book starts, I believe it is at a school. Something has happened. You don't know what has happened. You don't know to whom it has happened. But in the present day, you're seeing snippets of interviews from the police with the people who were at this gathering. And then it's flashing back to the months and days leading up to this event. And it's following primarily three different women and their own individual experiences and how that all influenced what happened at the end of this book. This was also adapted into an HBO miniseries with Reese Witherspoon and Nicole Kidman. And it was fantastically done. I enjoyed that one immensely. So even if you were not necessarily interested in reading the book, highly recommend checking out that adaptation because they did a fantastic job. But this was just a compulsively readable experience. I love the way that it was told, that mystery in the present that you don't really fully understand because you don't know exactly what happened and you don't know to whom it happened and you don't find that out until the end. But it all kind of culminates with what you've learned about these three characters and what these three women have in common is that their kids, their five-year-old kids, all attend the same school. And that's how they connect and that's how be they become friends. But there's also a little bit of drama between some of the five-year-olds and it just goes from there. It was fantastic. I remember my reading experience of this being very enjoyable, very page-turning. I wanted to know what happened. I enjoyed this one a lot. Next, I have Me Before You by Jojo Moyes. This was my first and only experience with Jojo Moyes, but I'm absolutely willing to read more from her in the future because of my experience with this story. She has a new contemporary coming out in February that I'm absolutely interested in diving into because I remember being completely enamored by this book from almost like the first page of the story. So this follows our main character, Louisa Clark, and at the very start of this book, she's a very ordinary girl living an average life. She's got a loving family. She's got a steady boyfriend. She hasn't really traveled any further than their tiny little village. And then one day she's offered the position of caretaker of a man named Will Trainer. And Will Trainer used to be this performance athlete until an accident basically ended life as he knew it because now he is wheelchair bound and he relies on constant care. And so naturally Will is kind of as you would expect him to be. He's very bitter. He's very angry. He's bossy. He's not the most likable human being. But Louisa is not really willing to deal with his crap. She doesn't treat him with kid gloves. She gives it right back to him. And soon they strike up this really heartfelt friendship where Louisa is very concerned about Will and his health. And Will is trying to encourage Louisa to go out and do more and be more because she has the opportunity to do so where he doesn't really have that opportunity anymore. This was just so touching. It was heartbreaking and it was about so many things, you know, hope and strength and forgiveness, moving on, letting go, overcoming fear and things of that. I just remember loving this book with my whole heart and soul. And I am absolutely looking forward to reading more from Jojo Moyes in the future. Then I have the three Jodi Picot books that I've decided to keep on my shelves. I have House Rules, which follows this family of an autistic boy who is kind of accused of a crime. It is told from multiple perspectives and I found it really well done. Then I have 19 Minutes. Y'all, it has been about 10 years since I read this story. I remember absolutely nothing about this, except that I believe it follows a school shooting. I just remember being absolutely captivated by this story, which is one reason that I kept it on my shelves. And that brings me 
to The Storyteller, which is actually one of the best World War II historical fiction pieces that I have ever read in my entire life. So this follows our main character, Sage, and she is a baker that has basically been dealing with a lot of grief since her mother died in this car accident. It's the same accident that left a disfiguring scar across Sage's face. Her life suddenly changes when she befriends Joseph Weber, who is also a member of this grief group that she goes to, but is a frequent patron of the bakery where she works. And they definitely bond over their grief, but one night Joseph reveals a very disturbing secret to Sage. He reveals that he was a Nazi during World War II and was responsible for the death of countless people. And this horrifies Sage because she knows what her grandmother went through in World War II. And Joseph is seeking forgiveness. He wants to die and he wants Sage's help to die. Sage, who is absolutely disgusted and horrified by this revelation, contacts the FBI to alert them to the fact that she knows of a Nazi war criminal who is living in the United States and she is connected to Leo. And Leo is working with Sage to kind of uncover more about Joseph's past. So you're following Sage and Leo in the present as they are uncovering more of Joseph's story. And then you are following the past. You're following Joseph in the past and you're also following Minka, who is Sage's grandmother and her experience in concentration camps and everything like that. Holy cow, guys, this was phenomenal. This was so beautiful. And I was sobbing after the twist at the end. I think if you were looking for it or even actively trying to determine what the twist would be, that you could have seen it coming possibly. But I was so absorbed in the story. I was so absorbed with the past timeline and going through what Sage's grandmother's experiences were going through. And then Sage in the future as she's trying to deal with this horrific revelation that has just been placed at her feet and what Joseph wants her to help him do. And the moral struggles that go along with that. I was just so involved that I did not see any of this coming. And then when that twist came, it was just like a punch to my heart. It really was. I was just in tears. I couldn't absolutely believe it. And it's because of that twist. It's because of the different aspects of the story that just makes this book stand out so thoroughly as such a beautiful World War II historical fiction. If you love historical fiction and have not actually read this story and didn't realize that it was historical fiction, I highly recommend, especially if you were a fan of World War II historical fiction, because this was just phenomenal. I cannot even explain to you enough how wonderful the story was. And then the very last book that I have on the shelf is one that you will have heard me talk about quite a lot recently, Remarkably Bright Creatures by Shelby Van Pelt. So this follows our main character, Tova Sullivan, and she is getting on in life. She's in, I want to say that she's probably like in her late 60s, early 70s, and she's experienced quite a lot of tragedy. 30 years prior to the start of the story, when her son was only 18, he mysteriously disappeared off of a boat in the Puget Sound. Nobody ever figured out what happened to him, but the police thought it was suicide, and Tova just realized that could never be the case, but she's never able to prove it. And now in recent times, her husband has died from a battle with cancer, and so now she's kind of truly on her own, aside from this solid group of friends that she has. And so to fill her days, she actually works doing janitorial services at the local aquarium overnight. And during her time at the aquarium, she develops this unusual bond with Marcellus, who is a giant Pacific octopus. And so this is primarily following Tova and her life both inside and outside of the aquarium and Marcellus is really just a side character but you do get Marcellus's perspective and he was phenomenal. He's like one of my new favorite literary characters because I just loved him so much and I do really wish that we got more of his perspective in here but I'm just so grateful for the perspective that we have. We also follow another character named Cam who ends up connecting with Tova and I don't really want to say more than that because it's really about the journey of finding who Cam is and why he's important to the story. So I'm not going to say anything more about his perspective because his perspective is actually not even mentioned in the dust jacket of this. When you read the synopsis of this book, it really makes you think that it's almost fully about Tova and Marcellus, which is what I went in here expecting. And while I did like the story overall and I liked the direction that it took and I thought that this was absolutely beautiful and wonderful, I still do wish that we had more of Tova and Marcellus's relationship. I don't necessarily feel like there was enough of that in this story to build the bond that they were supposedly to have had in this book, but overall I still really love this one immensely and I think it deserves all the hype that it's given. Not to mention that I love octopuses, octopi, I'm not sure the plural of that, but I just, I love them. They're so insanely intelligent creatures and it is because of that. It's because they are remarkably bright creatures that you get Marcellus's perspective and you get his viewpoint of being trapped in an aquarium and what that's been like and what he observes through humanity. His perspectives on human beings is phenomenal. It just made me laugh. So this was absolutely heartwarming and touching and I highly, highly recommend if you have not already picked it up. All right, y'all, that is it. That is it for this next round of the bookshelf series. Please comment down below and let me know how you are enjoying this series. If you think that I should maybe make any changes to how I'm doing this series, if you are loving the way that it is going so far. Please let me know if you have read any of the books that I talked about today and what your thoughts were on them. I would love to know. And as always, if you like this video or if you just like me, please be sure to give it a big thumbs up and subscribe if you haven't already, because I would sure love to see you in my next video. Bye guys. Mm -hmm.